A Genome-Wide Association Study, or a GWAS for short, is basically a study in which you get a large sample of individuals that have a particular disorder or, or trait and a large sample of people who don't have that trait. And what it allows us to do is we genotype those people and we sort of slather about a million markers across the entire genome. And then we compare the genomes of people with the illness to people without the illness. And where significant differences arise is where genes that influence risk for that disorder might lie. In its most basic sense, this study confirms that there's a genetic component to anorexia nervosa. But it takes us one step further than that. What it's done is it's identified eight areas on the genome where genes that influence risk for anorexia nervosa may lie. Now, although this is a breakthrough, it's also just a beginning, because we're anticipating that there are going to be hundreds of genes associated with anorexia nervosa. So that's the first finding. The second finding is really intriguing. And this is actually what we call genetic correlations. So we took all of the information underlying this GWAS for anorexia nervosa, and we correlated it with 447 other GWASs of other traits, from other psychiatric disorders to metabolic phenotypes to educational attainment. And a number of significant findings, significant correlations arose. And the pattern of correlations is such that there is very clear positive genetic correlations between anorexia nervosa and other psychiatric disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and anxiety disorders. And in fact, that genetic correlation with obsessive compulsive, di compulsive disorder is one of the strongest positive genetic correlations in psychiatric genetics. And the neat thing about that is it mirrors what we see in the clinic. So often we see people with anorexia who have OCD, depression, and anxiety, but basically the genes are now telling us that what we're seeing is due to genetic factors, which is a really interesting outcome. But we take it one step further. So in addition, other types of genetic correlations that we saw are with a bunch of metabolic and anthropometric or body measurement phenotypes. So suddenly, we see that anorexia nervosa is not only a psychiatric disorder, but it also has a metabolic component. And this is a novel finding from this study. So traditionally, anorexia nervosa has been viewed primarily through a psychological lens. And now, I think what we need to do is we need to add a second lens, and we need to start looking through that metabolic lens as well. This doesn't immediately tell us what the underlying biology is, but it points toward clear next steps of research that need to be done. We need to understand exactly what the metabolic component is and how it influences anorexia. In the interim, one very important message is how critical it is to adequately re-nourish people with anorexia nervosa. Especially in the United States, we often see that insurance companies will deauthorize treatment prematurely. So people will be discharged from the hospital before their bodies have had an opportunity to sort of re-equilibrate or stabilize at a healthy weight. And so this suggests that getting the metabolism stabilized again might be a very important, in fact, core component to recovery from anorexia nervosa. One of the main principles behind GWAS is to elucidate biology. What's the underlying biology of the illness, in this case, anorexia nervosa? And we've identified these first eight genes, and we have some hints about how they're starting to assort in pathways. But as we increase our sample size and identify more genes, those pathways are gonna become more clear. And then what we're hoping to do is engage our physiologist friends, our neuroscientist friends, our pharmacogenetic friends, and start actually developing medications that directly target the underlying biology of the illness. Because right now, we have no medications that are effective in the treatment of anorexia nervosa. So I think there are three limitations of this study. And even though people hear 17,000 people with anorexia, it makes them think that it's a big study. It's actually just a moderately sized GWAS. So we're actually aiming to get 100,000 participants. So sample size is one of the limitations. A second limitation is we don't have enough men. 
Um, and we really want to understand whether the same genes that influence risk for anorexia in girls and in women also influence risk for anorexia in men. So as we expand our sample size, we're going to have to work really hard to recruit men to participate. And then the third thing is, this study was primarily on people of European ancestry, because when we started the study, we actually didn't have the techniques to analyze more diverse samples. But now we have those techniques. So as we increase our sample size, we're going to sample widely, and we're going to make sure we have representation from all racial and ethnic categories. A really important thing for people to keep in mind when they interpret the results of this study is that genetics are not destiny. So when we're born, we get 50% of our genes from our mother and 50% of our genes from our father. In that mix of genes, you're going to have a certain number of risk genes for anorexia nervosa. But you're also going to have some buffering genes or genes that make it less likely for you to develop that illness. And then plus, we have to throw in the environment. So in the environment, you have high-risk environmental situations, but you also have buffering environmental situations. And it's those four buckets, the risk genes, buffering genes, risk environment, and buffering environment, that together make up your risk. So it's very complicated how at risk you are and who's at risk for developing this illness. The next study, we're going to expand beyond anorexia nervosa. We're going to continue collecting individuals who had anorexia nervosa, but we're also going to broaden out to the other eating disorders. So we're going to be recruiting people to participate who have bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. And this study is called EDGY, or the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative. And it's going to be easier to participate in this one because for Angie, we had to collect blood from everyone, but technology has advanced in the last six years, and now all we have to do is spit into a tube and fill out some questionnaires online. So stay tuned. We'll be launching EDGY soon, and our goal is to get 100,000 participants, people who have had eating disorders at any time in their life. So even though this is a starting point, it is not too early for us to engage people from other fields. It would be wonderful to have people who really study metabolism for their life, for their career, to start looking at these data and see where we can go with it. It's not too early to get people involved from pharma who are interested in drug discovery. Because one of the things that we know, especially from all of these genetic correlations, is genetic information about anorexia doesn't just tell us about anorexia. It tells us about all of these other psychiatric disorders that it's related to, and now we know it tells us about all sorts of metabolic traits as well. So there are far-reaching implications now that we can start delving deeper in on a biological level.